I'd like to welcome you to American University Washington College of Law for our discussion of the controversial sale of the .org registry. Um, the conversation we should be having, and I just wanted to talk a little bit about what that subtitle means. Um, the conversation we should be having. So this, um, one of the meanings of it, there are two meanings. One has to do with a promise I made to Andrew Sullivan, one of our speakers, which is that we're gonna have a fireside chat. We're gonna have a calm, respectful conversation aimed at understanding the issues. We're gonna to talk to each other, not at each other. The internet policy world tends to talk at each other a little bit too much. We're gonna to talk to each other today. So please, please be respectful of the tenor and tone that we're trying to set. Two, the second meaning is that we're here to ask some of the difficult and complicated questions and explore some of the difficult and complicated issues of this complex transaction that's taking place with .org that has many elements. So we're hoping to clarify and understand better what is happening. We have two audiences here. We have the audience in the room and we thank you for coming. And we have the audience on the internet, which is, this is being carried live on YouTube and it's being rebroadcast, I understand, by the Internet Society. So thank you to our global audience who will be watching live and also the, recorded, uh, the recording will be posted as well. We do want to note for those following the live webcast that there is no remote participation. That's a feature we're trying to get for the future, but we don't have it right now. So all questions will come from within this room. Um, so I'm going to introduce some of the incredible speakers that we, all of the incredible speakers that we have today. Uh, if you could raise your hand, Andrew Sullivan is president and CEO of the Internet Society. He's worked on internet infrastructure since 2001 and when he worked on the launch of .info. He's part of the migration of .org out of VeriSign. Um, so part of kind of the origins of what we'll be talking about today. He served as chair of the Internet Architecture Board and was intimately involved in the IANA transition. Mitch Stoltz, could you raise your hand? Great. His senior staff attorney with the Electronic Frontier Foundation based in San Francisco, and he came in last night through the rain. He is one of the organizers of the Save.org Coalition and he works in intellectual property, free speech, and competition law. He was also formerly a software engineer for Netscape. Benjamin Leff is a professor of law here at American University Washington College of Law. He teaches courses on US federal tax law and the law of charitable and nonprofit organizations. And his research and scholarship focuses on the regulation of nonprofits and philanthropy. Thank you for being with us. Mark Rutenberg. So to my students in the room, Mark Rotenberg was who I had my summer internship with when I was in law school. So can my students in the room raise their hand? So there you go. Talk to Mark. Um, and he is, uh, as everyone knows, as many of us know, president and executive director of the Electronic Privacy Information Center, EPIC, which is based here in Washington, D.C. He teaches information privacy and open government at Georgetown Law and testifies frequently before Congress on privacy and civil liberties issues. And he was also an early chair of the .org Board of Directors. We did invite Ethos Capital and the Public Interest Registry, but they were unable to attend. So, um, so we've talked about the speakers, .org. What is .org? I'm going to give a little bit of an introduction, and then we'll hand it to the speakers. What is .org? When we talk about it, we often use three different meanings depending on the context. .org is a registry. It's a database of domain names in the .org top-level domain. These domain names are, it's the registry's job, the registry that runs .org, to ensure the routing of these domain names so that People looking for them can find their web pages, the email addresses, et cetera. So .org is a database and, and the, the company that runs, the registry that runs that database. To become a registry operator, you have to sign a contract with the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, which we call ICANN, which the Public Interest Registry did. .org is one of the oldest registries. It's one of the original seven created in 1985, .com, .org, .net, .edu, .gov, .mil, and .int. .org is also a set of registrants, domain name owners, 10 million of them. Uh, some .org registrants have held their domain name for decades. EFF.org has held it since 1990, according to the WHOIS records. Redcross.org goes back to 1995. .org is also third a community of users. 
who go to .org domain names and websites for non-commercial news, education, and information. For example, I go to Doctors Without Borders for information and to give donations. Amnesty International for information on Amnesty International's campaign for human rights around the world. I visited my children's public school website, which was a .org, nearly every day in the winter to find out they were hoping for a delay, so to find out a school was delayed, and what the cafeteria was serving for lunch. We visit our church, synagogue, and mosque websites for the times of our local services. This year, we may be visiting Democrats.org and RepublicanNationalCommittee.org more often than we have in the past, uh, as, as we go, uh, as we may consult the Democratic and Republican National Committee websites for the elections approaching. Quick note, .org does not pre-select or pre-screen its registrants. Anyone can register in a .org domain. And the people and groups that come together tend to come together there to share non-commercial information. So Sony, through sonyfoundation.org, as of two days ago, was posting information about the impact of the recent Australian bushfires on communities' environments across Australia. And lots of individuals have .org domain names where they share their own ideas and insights and thoughts and advice. So why are we here? Why are you here? Very briefly, we're here because, and I'll, I'll let the speakers dive into this much, much more, but in 2002, a registry named VeriSign held .com, .org, and .net registries and was told they had to spin one off. ICANN held a competitive process for .org, which VeriSign had decided to spin off, and the Internet Society, a nonprofit based in Reston, Virginia, which Andrew heads, uh, won the contract. And... <coughs> During the process of competing for .org, the Internet Society, and actually I'm going to go ahead and post my, uh, my, my list of institutions and acronyms, the Internet Society founded another nonprofit called the Public Interest Registry to run .org. By all accounts, the relationship has been positive. Uh, when, in, when the 2004 transfer took place, there were 2.7 million domain names in .org. There are now over 10 million. In November, the Internet Society announced its intention to sell the Public Interest Registry for $1.1 billion to Ethos Capital, a newly formed equity firm. And with that, I will almost, almost turn the floor over to our speakers, but we have a special, special guest speaker, George Sadowski, who's going to introduce us to a little bit of personal history. He was a trustee with the Internet Society in 2004, when it took over the .org registry. He's also a member of the Internet Hall of Fame. He was an ICANN board member for many, many years um, and is a pioneer of computing and connectivity uh, across the world. George, it's an honor to introduce you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, as Kathy said, I'm here to give you a little history and it's all personal history according to the way I saw it at the time. Um, I joined ISOC in 1992, um, and uh, for the first 10 years of, until 2002, ISOC was uh, really uh, doing very interesting and good things, running major workshops for developing countries, supporting the IETF, um, getting involved in policy processes, starting a magazine, which I think lasted until 2000, uh, but it would it did not ever, uh, during that period, find a decent financial footing. And so in 2002, when the, um, uh, the financial situation was, I would say, slightly less than dire, but certainly, certainly really important, um, uh, ISAC saw the bidding for .org and taking the .org registry as being a very desirable thing if they could win it. So um, I went back uh, uh, over the weekend. I looked at my email from 2002 and the, the fundamental documents that led to the development of uh, a PIR and um, uh, its, uh, its custodianship of uh, .org, it was a very um, exciting time because in two, uh, late 2001, the domain name industry had taken a significant dip it, uh, and uh, .org went down something like 400,000 registrations. Uh, this was probably due to the short-term, what we now know as short-term effects, of the uh, dot com market and followed by the dot com market break, followed by a lot of people losing a lot of money. Uh, but uh, after the, 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 so the board was uh, was not united on this at all at the beginning. And in fact, I think there was a dissenting vote um, at the end in terms of uh, taking up uh, the uh, the challenge to get dot org. It was a difficult decision. 
um, PIR, which was the ultimate name of the uh, of um, whatever we called it, no name or whatever, uh, in the uh, process of applying, uh, based its campaign, we based the the uh, application and. Um, a good part of the application was devoted to marketing, and the, the marketing uh, was st stress was not for profits. This is a home for not for profits. None of the material ever said this is only a home for not for profits, but it was clear that the marketing was in the direction of making this home uh, that would uh, cater to not for profits in certain ways with, ed with extra services, additional services, not major, but they were in the proposal. Uh, and uh, this was uh, this was thought to be a very strong factor in the uh, um, determination of who would win the bid. I don't think it was based on a review of the preliminary and the final uh, the, uh, analyses. Uh, it looked like the criteria had nothing to do with content, uh, and this was significant. Um, I think significantly in line with what ICANN wanted, because ICANN has never wanted to be in the content business. In, in, any, in any way. So I, I, I saw it won the bid, PIR was formed, and so it became a home for really two kinds of people. And this was a bifurcation that occurred early on. Uh, during, the, um, dur during the work up to the application and getting the award, a lot of us talked about how good this would be. This would be a home for not-for-profits. We could make it a real home. Um, it would be, uh, if I can uh, exaggerate somewhat, um, um, a bulwark against the, uh, against the attacks of, of prominent capitalism, which was attacking the internet space at that time. Uh, we saw it as pure and good and defending everything that was noble. Uh, and that bifurcation uh, has, I think, existed to this day. Um, it was... Uh, uh, a remarkable constructive piece of constructive ambiguity uh, in which we could agree, we could believe what we wanted, but um, uh, and, and the, uh, what PIR did and what uh, .org did uh, satisfied both beliefs, but now that constructive ambiguity has been broken and uh, we are facing the consequences of it. Let me stop here. Thank you, George. Um, now we'll turn it over to Andrew Silva, who will kind of kick us off. And uh, the order is Andrew, then Mitch, Ben, and Mark. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here this afternoon. I'm, uh, I think this is a, a great opportunity. One of the things that uh, I think has been true is that the, the, the discussion around around this potential <laughs> transaction has sometimes foundered on some misunderstandings and so on. So I'm really keen that we spend some time today trying to you know, lay some of these, uh, some, of the, some of the basics out. I, I joined the Internet Society in 2018, and so some of you will be familiar, familiar with this if you've been following this online and so on, but I'll give you some background. Uh, I joined in, in September of 2018 as the, as the CEO. I was a member for a long time before that. Um, and we did not have um, a, a lot of, of concern about PIR, about .org, and so on. It was not in any way the, the primary um, driver of my, uh, of my thinking at the time. There are a number of things that the Internet Society needs to do. We have a, a very broad uh, mandate and a, a large uh, set of issues that we confront. And uh, you know, frankly, from my point of view, the Internet is under attack. When I, when I came onto the internet in, I don't know, a million years ago, um, the, uh, you know, everybody thought the internet was just a good thing. It was something that everybody wanted. If you ask people, you know, would you like internet access? Everybody, oh yeah, that's a good idea. And that is no longer true. And I think that's a shame. I think that the internet is one of the most human tools ever invented. It's, it's a, a, a tool of tremendous opportunity because its design pushes the ability of people to work right into their own hands. It allows them to do, to do the things. And that's what the Internet Society concentrates on. Uh, we concentrate on making sure that the Internet is available for everyone. Our, we like to say that our, the Internet is for everyone. And that's the, that's the thing that we're working on all of the time. So back in 2002, in that period when this transition happened, 
Public Interest Registry, PIR, <laughs> is created as a supporting organization of, uh, of the Internet Society. And this is a class of uh, things. In commercial terms, you would think of it as a subsidiary, but that's not really the way nonprofits work. Um, and it provides a lot of income to the Internet Society. In fact, it, it, that's its, its purpose, is in part to support the Internet Society. And we depend on that income in order to fund these other activities that we, we undertake to, to support the Internet. Uh, we have uh, received tremendous um, support from the internet uh, um, from PIR over all of that time. But I will confess that when I joined the Internet Society, I was a little concerned about this because I have a long history. I'm, I'm the only non-lawyer up here, um, and I, I'm, a, I'm a nerd. I, I worked on on you know actual technology for many years, uh, and I worked uh, in the back end, for instance, on the PIR um, creation when we when we brought .org over. It was my hot little hands on the keyboard that made um, uh, that made the transition happen. So I've seen this from the from the operation side of the house, from understanding the way the net, the network works. And there is a, a fact that has been troubling me for a number of years. I worked in the DNS uh, at other companies as well, and the domain name <coughs> system, which is is part of what .org is it, it's a piece of it, is changing. And there are many ways in which it's changing. One of the ways in which it's changing is that you don't use it very much uh, in the same way anymore. You, you know, when, when back in 2002, the way you interacted with the internet primarily was through keyboards. You, you typed things, um, you know, Google existed, but um, it was not the juggernaut that it is today. And, uh, and you typed domain names in into a URL bar. But you don't do that anymore. Nobody does that anymore. It's, it's really a search bar. It, it automatically searches for you. And anyway, most of us use apps for a lot of things. And of course, you never type a domain name in an app. So the, this is one piece of the reality that has changed over time. Another piece that has changed um, is that the, the top level domain um, area, the, the, the domains, you know, org and edu and so on, back in 2002, there was a very small number of them. And in, and in 2001, we actually added a few more, and that was, in fact, how I got into this game. I, I turned on .info uh, in 2001. Um, funny story, I, um, we went live on the 12th of September, 2001. So I have a very different memory of September 11th than everybody else in North America. Um, uh, and when we did that, it was still a very small group of top-level domains. But in the interim, ICANN made the decision to expand on um, the top level. And so there, you know, they added more than 1,000 additional um, uh, top level domains. And this changes uh, the environment in which, uh, in which .org has to operate. And these were things that were you know, on my mind, but they were not my preoccupation as I started this job. So last year, um, uh, Ethos Capital approached us, and they approached us with an offer that had to do with how they wanted to invest in this system for the future. Because I've been nervous about, about the health of .org and .com and every other top level domain, uh, I, had, um, I, I saw this and I said, oh, they don't want to just take this thing and sort of you know, soak it, you know, kind of wring it out of cash and then and leave, leave an empty husk. They want to invest in this company because they have a plan for the future. They want to build this system up, they, they think that there is value in there, and I think there's value there. I, I spent you know, nearly 20 years of my life working on the DNS. I think, that, I think there's value there. But I think that it needs to evolve and grow, and it needs attention. It needs specialist investment from people who are really gonna pay attention to how that business can grow and develop in favor of the people who register inside that registry, in favor of the people who are dependent on .org domain name. And that's something that is a, a very small piece of all of the concerns that the Internet Society is worried about. We are worried about people not having access. You know, here in the United States, ha almost half the world's population doesn't have access to the Internet. Here in the United States, the country that invented the Internet, in New York City, the densest market in the country, there are people who cannot get Internet access today. And we think that that's wrong, and we want to work on those things. We hear now governments, you know, we used to worry about authoritarian governments in various other countries and everything. Now I worry about the governments of Germany and the United States wanting to break everybody's encryption. They want to steal your ability to do banking. And I think that that's really important. 
and I think we need to pay attention to it and we need to work on it. And that's what the Internet Society is focused on. But this means that we cannot focus on the growth of, a, of an industry that is, is a capable industry, and a capable industry with people who want to invest in it. That industry was developed according to decisions by the US government made in the 1990s. Um, the Clinton administration decided to set the, the current modern um, arrangement up, and the ICANN community has picked that up, and they've developed their processes for it, and that's how, they, how this system is governed. So we saw this opportunity of somebody who was coming, and they wanted to invest in this. They want to build on this thing. It's good for the Red <laughs> Grant because it builds the, uh, builds the system up. It's good for PIR. It's good for the people who work there. And of course, it provides the Internet Society with a uh, substantial endowment to continue our, um, our work on the Internet as well. And when something looks that way, where everybody gets something out of it, where I come from, you say, oh, well, everybody's <coughs> winning, you should do that. So that's the reason that we did it. Uh, my board looked at this hard, and um, they came to the same conclusion. The board of PIR uh, looked at it hard, they came to the same conclusion. All the people voted in favor of it. Uh, my board is selected from the community. So uh, it's, it's selected by our chapters, it's selected by, um, by the organizational members, and it's, it's selected by the Internet Engineering Task Force, so there's a great diversity there. The whole point of that um, selection is so that they can do these kinds of decisions and make those sorts of decisions properly, you know, with the interests of the, of the different, different parts of the community in mind. So that's the decision that they made, and um, I believe that this, I remain convinced that this is good for everyone. I think it's a transaction that is tremendously beneficial to, um, to PIR and to .org and also to the Internet Society and the rest of the Internet. But I think that that's a really important part of this. It's future looking. It's looking towards what are the changes that need to happen uh, for this organization to thrive and grow and be strong long into the future. I think that's a really critical thing that we need to address. Uh, and you know, I understand <clears throat> that people you know, are skeptical about some of these things, but I really do think that if you look at you know, all of the considerations that are in place, there's a real opportunity here for the whole internet. So I'm going to leave it there so I don't take up all the oxygen and we can um, get on to some conversation. But thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, do you want to come up, Mitch? And we understand that there is uh, some problem with the audio uh, for remote participants, so we're working on that. Just uh, that's the activity in the background. Uh, come on up, Mitch. and. Let us transfer slides to yours. And you can work from here or you can work from here. Whatever you like. This button. Great. Yeah, thanks, Kathy, uh, Andrew, and, and uh, everyone listening in. Uh, I appreciate the introduction, and I won't belabor it, but. Um, wanted to talk about why the sale of PIR to Ethos Capital is concerning to the .org community. So for starters, who is the .org community? Um, and uh, my organization, EFF, has, has, has been active on this issue, but, but we are far from the only ones. I'm going to talk about uh, who else is involved to some degree. But, but, but as we say, the, the, the .org community, um, it is, at its heart, it is the, the world of nonprofits, NGOs, and other mission-driven organizations, including ones that are unincorporated. They are local clubs. They are operating in, in places where having a uh, formal incorporation is not possible. Or, or um, And then it's the members and visitors to the websites of those organizations is the people who rely on them. It is the, the people that they benefit. So those are all the people who are, who are who are at stake, and I know Andrew talked about the, the broader mission of ISOC, um, but I want to focus a little bit on the the .org community and what this transaction means 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 for them, and and it is uh, it's a key part of the of internet users, but but it's a different part of internet users, um, fundamentally often relying on donations, relying on on certain funding sources, um, and they're organizations that challenge the powerful. So they are watchdogs on the commercial world, on governments. They are, they are people who make enemies, and they're people who are often targets of, of, of censorship. And they don't always have the same financial resources. Um, 
this is who's in in, in org and, and I, I thank uh, telepathy.com for for the research that, that this is based on and this is based on a, a sampling of a thousand uh, domain names within org um, there are 10 million names a little bit more than 10 million names registered in org of those about one and a half million are nonprofit organizations uh, nearly another one and a half million about one and a quarter million are other non-commercial endeavors, including personal, family, and unincorporated groups. And less than half a million of them are, spec are, are domain speculators based on this research. Now, why is this community concerned about the sale of PIR? It's a number of factors. And I want to emphasize that it's not limited to the transition from nonprofit to for profit, although that, that, that is a key part of it, it it's really a big confluence of factors, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about each one of these. Um, the first was the timing of the deal, the partial timeline. <coughs> Shortly before this was announced, and this is in the spring of last year, ICANN and PIR renegotiated their contract. This is the contract that allows PIR to operate a domain registry as a power delegated to them from ICANN. And for the first time, they had proposed to remove uh, the price cap on annual registration fees. They also included some other concerning clauses, which, which we wrote about at the time. One of them was uh, um, permission for PIR to engage in pro uh, the protection of the rights of third parties. Which, in other contexts, and I'll talk about this a little bit, um, has been um, a kind of a code word for regulating content or taking away people's domain domain names, suspending domain names based on the concerns of other of third parties of outside groups. Um, these are fun these can be, if abused, are forms of censorship, and. To have them done by a private organization, by, you know, uh, not through a court process or, or with any sort of democratic accountability, that's, that's, that's a real problem. Um, there were over 3,000 comments opposing the removal of price caps and, and, the, and uh, many of them opposing some of the other, the, the other issues here. Um, during that comment period, Ethos Capital was incorporated, so in May of last year. And then just after that, in June, ICANN confirmed that it, that it would be removing the price caps and adding those um, uh, additional permissions to the, to the agreement. And that, that agreement would last another 10 years. Um, just a few months after that, in September, it was published, uh, uh, as, as we understand it, was when Ethos approached uh, the board of, of ISOC about uh, wanting to buy PIR, uh, that was announced to the world in November. So that confluence of events is concerning because it, it looks like um, for, for those who knew that the contract negotiations were on this trend, uh, that the price caps would be going away, that these additional mechanisms would receive ICANN's blessing, and that those would seem to make PIR a more uh, attractive uh, asset uh, for a private equity firm. Um, so this was a little bit of history about what the, uh, this protection of the rights of third parties or rights protection mechanisms. And these are all things that have happened in the domain name world. Um, some of these concern domain names themselves. These tend to be trademark disputes. Uh, or, or cyber squatting issues regarding names themselves. Some of them cross the line into being a regulation of web content, you wielding the power of domain name suspension to make a quote unquote bad website go dark. A um, number of these were pioneered by another registry called Donuts, which runs uh, <coughs> oh, more than 200 of the, the new top level domains and which has a lot of personnel overlap with uh, Ethos Capital and PIR. Um, so there was one called DPML Plus, which was essentially trademark owners paying donuts, the registry, not to register certain domain names. 
um, on the theory that, that any registration of those domain names would be cyber squad and would trigger mark infringement and so on. Um, that was not an ICANN policy. That was a, that was a unilateral corporate policy. But it, ta it takes away from the universe of, of names that the world can use at the request of uh, industries and power, you know, powerful companies with, with brands who want to pay for this privilege. Um, those mechanisms started to cross the line into um, regulation of, of web content itself. Um, with there were, there were things variously called uh, trusted notifier agreements, donuts, and at least one other registry made agreements with the Motion Picture Association to suspend dom <clears throat> domain names accused of copyright infringement. Again, it's private law enforcement with no public process at all by which people can lose their domain names, causing their website to go dark. Then, uh, uh, similarly, there was, uh, there was pressure from groups related to uh, uh, U.S. Uh, drug enforcement and pharmacy interests to uh, pre were putting pressure on, web on registries to take down websites that even provided information about importing prescription medicines from Canada at a lower price. Um, and then uh, PIR, this is back in 2016, came, got into this effort. Um, by proposing um, a dispute resolution process for copyright claims against the contents of a website. So again, we, we're not talking about domain names. We're talking about the speech on a website through a process they were going to create that would lead to people losing their domain names because of an accusation of copyright infringement, but not a court order, not any sort of democratically accountable process. Um, a few weeks after proposing that, they, they withdrew it. We don't exactly know why, but we, 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 um, we think um, you know, there was a lot of outcry and a lot of community pressure on them about that. Um, so when I talk about this, this, this phrase, protection for the rights of third parties, that appeared in the new uh, PIR contract, that uh, to us raises the, the, the potential of all of these things. And these things are all potentially lucrative, or at least beneficial, for a private equity fund to you know to engage in. There is there is there is money to be made in these things. Um, so, who is Ethos Capital? And this is this is the second reason for our concern. It's been reported that that these uh, various private investors are investors in Ethos Capital. Um, these are not folks with history of working. You know, for the benefit of nonprofits, uh, just as, uh, as one example, this is from the, the mission statement of Solomir Capital here. It says, Solomir provides a vehicle that aims to enable CEOs and industry leaders to pool both their capital and their networks to source and add value to private investment opportunities. So this is about private profit for private <clears throat> investors. That's, that's the, and according to American corporate law, the, you know, the ultimate goal of the, people who are actually investing in this venture. Another factor is the purchase price. So uh, or more than $1.1 billion. Um, so uh, over the last several years, PIR has given between 30 and $50 million of its revenues to ISOC to fund ISOC's activity. Um, it actually really kind of takes, it will take a long time to, if that's, you know, at that level of remuneration to make up, to, to, to uh, make good on that $1.1 billion investment. Um, and, and on top of that, is, uh, uh, Ethos has disclosed that it's taking on $360 million in debt uh, to fund part of that purchase price. So that eats further into their returns. A private equity fund is going to have to earn a return that its investors expect. That probably means increasing the returns already that, that, that PIR is already producing and, and, and already um, forwarding on to, currently forwarding on to ISOC. How is that going to happen? That, this is where the real substantive concerns come in. How will they recoup that investment? Um, Ethos, PIR, and a, a, a number of uh, um, 
the commentators in the media have talked about new products and services or innovation, uh, that PIR, as a for-profit company owned by Ethos Capital, will engage in innovation, will give us new products and services. Nothing about what that means. Neither Ethos nor PIR nor some of the folks who commented on this in the media have, have, have said at all what that is, what that, what that even might be. And that's interesting because registries are wholesalers. Registries are actually contractually barred from selling domain name registrations directly to registrants, website owners. So they, they can sell other products and services, but in that core business, they are, they are, they are wholesalers. They do not sell directly to users or, 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 or website owners. That strongly suggests that these new products and services are going to be aimed at third parties. They're going to be aimed at other populations who may not have the same interests as the, the .org community. Um, so, what, so what might that be? Um, there's a few things I can speculate about, and you know, and, and we don't know. Again, nobody has really said. But there's a few sort of obvious things that one could, that, that we could see uh, them using to recoup these investments. Um, one is, is data mining DNS queries. Um, the registry operator can, if it chooses, see who is visiting .org websites or using apps that that, that contain .org uh, domain names or emailing to a .org email address. They don't necessarily see them all, but they can choose to. Um, and uh, there is, we notice, a, a digital advertising company called Vidmob, which Ethos Capital has also invested in. So one way to make good on that $1.1 billion investment might be to find out who is visiting .org domains and use that information to market to them. Or other profitable purposes. Yeah. The other is selling censorship, and these were some of the mechanisms that I talked about. And the last is price increases. There's been a lot of talk about this. Now, Ethos has publicly said that they will keep price increases to 10% a year on average. Um, the on average seems, seems like a, a, a bit of a dodge because that, that could mean some pretty large increases up front. But the, the, the point I'd like to make about price increases is that it's pure profit. The cost of running a registry is not increasing, it's decreasing. The, the cost is, is, is it's a very simple business. They maintain a database of who owns what domain. Uh, they, they make it secure and available to the world. The cost of that decreases. So even a one dollar increase a year is pure profit at the expense of those millions of nonprofit organizations. It's money that's not going to their charitable or mission-driven purposes. There's the the justification for it is is seems to be is is, is profit itself. So 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 real quick, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, um, 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 these. Groups have been leading the, the, the Save.org uh, coalition. Um, we held a protest uh, a couple of weeks ago at the front of ICANN's headquarters. And what's uh, happening now is, so uh, again, I, Ethos has made some public commitments. Um, none of them are legally binding. Um, they've talked about a stewardship council. It's not clear how that council would have any power to override the decisions of the investors or really to change policies of the organization at all. It is possible, I would say likely, that that's window dressing. Uh, meanwhile, the deal speeds ahead, and we, we, the details of the stewardship council have yet to be worked out. We, we're told that the deal is supposed to close uh, you know, within the next, uh, within, within, within the coming weeks. Uh, and, and meanwhile, none of these accountability mechanisms have, have actually taken form. And uh, I will leave it at that as my information, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much, Keith, for the background. Professor Lutz, would you like to speak from there, or would you like to come up here? I'll just come up there. Okay.
So great. Thank this you. And I hand the floor to you. Okay, thanks. So um, my name is Ben Leff. I'm a professor here at American University, and my field is nonprofit and philanthropy law. And Kathy asked me to be here, I think largely to just clarify some things about nonprofit law that it's I find it's hard for people to keep straight in their mind and a, a transaction like the transaction that's being uh, proposed, which involves the conversion of a 501c3 charity into a for-profit entity, and not just the conversion, but the conversion under Pennsylvania law, which has a slightly weird conversion statute compared to other, uh, other states, is sometimes hard to wrap your mind around. So I think my goal is to answer two questions, not to take too long doing it, and then uh, say a few very short things. So here are the questions that now, of course, oh, I can see them right here. Um, so the first question is just, can a nonprofit like ISOC sell a nonprofit like PIR? And the formal answer to that question is no. The relationship between two nonprofits, and my understanding of the relationship between ISOC and PIR is, they are each independent nonprofit organizations that qualifies for tax exempt status under Section 501c3 independently. PIR is, or ISOC is the, the sole member of PIR for corporate law purposes. And what that means in the nonprofit context is they control PIR in the sense that they can appoint the board of directors of PIR. They have the power to appoint them. And I haven't seen their bylaws, but generally they have the, appoint, the, the power to remove uh, board members uh, as well. So they're determining who is the board of PIR. Um, but they don't own PIR in the sense that a nonprofit can't be owned uh, and so they can't sell it. So PIR has its own nonprofit board and each of those board members and the board collectively has their own fiduciary duties to uh, the entity, to PIR. And the most important of those fiduciary duties for our purposes is the nonprofits have that for-profits don't have is called the duty of obedience. And that means that the board of directors has an obligation to act in good faith to try and advance the tax exempt purposes of the entity. And that's their duty. Their duty is in effect to the purposes of the entity, not to any individual person. Again, unlike a, um, uh, in a for-profit context where the board of directors of a company does have a duty to the shareholders of that company, in the nonprofit context, the duty runs to the purposes of the nonprofit, not to the entity that has the control over the nonprofit. Now, in addition to the fact that they are a, uh, a, a for-profit with a sole member that has the power to appoint the board, they also, under federal law, they're what's called a supporting organization. And a supporting organization is actually a structure that determines whether you're a private foundation or not a private foundation. But the requirements of a supporting organization are that it has to be controlled by its supported organization, in this case, ISOC. And it has to have as a purpose supporting the supported organization. So PIR couldn't say uh, it, the best way to fulfill our tax exempt purposes is to stop entirely supporting ISOC. Their status is dependent on the fact that they're supporting ISOC. They're providing resources to, provide, to support ISOC. Um, Oh, that's the second question I jumped ahead. Is PIR's sole purpose to provide funds to ISOC? And the answer to that also is no. It's their sole purpose is not to provide funds to ISOC. They have this duty of obedience, which means that they, one of their purposes, and in some ways their most important purpose, is to provide funds to ISOC to advance ISOC's tax exempt purposes. But they also can act independently and have a duty of obedience to be sure that they are acting in the interests of their tax exempt purpose. So that just raises the question, what is their tax exempt purpose? Significant component of it is to provide funds to ISOC to advance tax exempt purposes. This is just a quote from their amended articles of incorporation. E is removed, that's the one that just says to support ISOC. 
There's then flesh language that emphasizes the provision of the support to ISOC. But you can see here there's a number of other things, things that are related that, uh, that uh, PIR has as part of their purposes, what they are attempting to do in order to more generally support their texts and purposes of educating people about the internet, facilitating access to the internet, whatever the best way to describe those uh, purposes are. Um, uh, I don't think, I'm, <laughs> I have a slide here to emphasize then or to help explain the question of, well, if, the, if it's not possible to sell a nonprofit to another entity for a, for a charity to be sold to a for-profit owners, then what is going on? And this slide is an attempt from the materials that I've seen to describe what is going on. Really quickly, what is going on is that PIR, the child entity, is going to convert to a for-profit. And under um, Pennsylvania law, you're allowed to do what is called a conversion in place. That's a conversion of a nonprofit to a for-profit entity. The key is that none of the value of the assets can be removed from the charitable stream. So in effect, someone has to continue advancing the taxes and purposes of PIR, but it won't be PIR anymore because they're converting to a for-profit. So my understanding of the plan is, is that there'll be a creation of uh, another new entity called G CGF, and unfortunately I can't remember what that charitable stands for. What? Connected, charitable Giving. Connected Giving. Connected, connected Giving, giving sorry. Foundation. foundation. That entity will be created. Um, it will become, it will first be a member of PIR, and then it will become the owner when PIR becomes an LLC, that is a for-profit entity, it will become the owner of uh, PIR. And you can, I kind of, yellow entities are for-profits, blue entities are non-profits. And then the transaction then will be, it will sell all of its membership stake in PIR, the for-profit, to an entity created by Ethos Capital in order to buy it, which my understanding is called Purpose Domains Direct LLC. So in exchange for that $1.1 billion, so the $1.1 billion will flow into CGF. CGF will then be, in effect, obligated to use that money to fulfill PIR's taxes and purposes. Meanwhile, the everything that is PIR, including the registry, the .org registry will go over into the for-profit world and be owned by Purpose Domains LLC, which is uh, owned by Ethos. So no longer will PIR or that registry be bound by the charity law requirements that it be used to advance tax and purposes. That mission uh, and obligation will uh, be held by CGF, and they um, uh, are have to, in effect, use that $1.1 million to, to do that. Um, the, um, ultimately, it's PIR's board that makes the decision about how to fully fulfill their taxes and purposes. My understanding, again, is as a supporting organization, that decision would have to be then approved by ISOC's board. So both boards have to be on board. Uh, sorry, um, for the idea that this is the best way to advance the tax and purposes. And then the question is, uh, I guess, uh, ultimately for them, but then also for some regulators and other checks in the system is, is it, can they adequately fulfill their tax and purpose after selling the entity that controls the registry? And just really briefly, from a nonprofit space, the regulators are either the IRS, which the IRS is most concerned about whether that $1.1 billion is the full value of the assets that are owned by PIR, or technically of PIR itself. Is If that $1.1 billion is the full value of PIR from a financial point of view, then the main thing that the IRS is concerned about has been satisfied. The Pennsylvania Attorney General has oversight more generally, uh, historically has a kind of more paternalist oversight of charitable organizations, and that the, uh, uh, the, uh, a court in, in Pennsylvania will have to determine that the transaction uh, is adequately fulfills the tax and purposes of PIR. And the uh, uh, Pennsylvania Attorney General could be a party to that um, if they wanted to be. So that would be another kind of regulatory check. The last thing I was going to say in, uh, in the 30 seconds I have left is just that 
That transaction, you know, the transaction is structured as a sale of PIR in other contexts where there are nonprofit conversions, not always, but sometimes uh, uh, checks are put in place to continue the involvement of the charitable entity in the management of the for-profit entity. And those are all, I mean, obviously, I'm not second-guessing the transaction terms here, but those are always possible. In other words, it isn't uncommon for the charitable entity to maintain some ownership interest in the for-profit uh, entity that's created, and then to sometimes to have special powers to approve or disapprove certain types of changes to operating. So the discussion about whether there are certain types of things that the .org community is especially concerned about, and whether the promises that Ethos Capital has made are really binding commitments or are just uh, uh, you know uh, things that you say, obviously there are ways that you could structure the transaction to make any particular promise a binding commitment um, if, the, if that was desired or, or necessary to advance the tax and purposes. So, right. could, could you know, two articles? This one. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Professor Leff, thank you very much, and thank you for spending your weekends, the last few weekends, looking into all of these documents and for that chart that really helps to crip what's going on. Uh, Mark Rodenberg, uh, you get to uh, wrap us up in terms of speakers. Over to you. Great. Well, I just want to begin by thanking uh, Kathy for organizing this panel and bringing together the speakers. As people who have been in the ICANN world probably know, there are often contentious debates, a bit of name calling. I don't think that has ever been particularly productive. And I really just want to thank you, Kathy, for the tone and the seriousness and really the thoughtful uh, commentary from, from all the panelists. I'm going to uh, bookend the discussion a little bit, do kind of a back to the future thing, and join George maybe even before the creation of the Internet Society in the early 1990s. I was here in Washington, D.C. in the early 1980s uh, trying to help nonprofits uh, use microcomputers. And we were very excited at that time about the opportunity that inexpensive, uh, portable computing would provide to, uh, as Mitchell said, advocates. I worked with many of the groups in the 80s that you had mentioned, ACLU and Amnesty and others, and you know, for not a whole lot of money, I see Mike Godwin, Mike's also of this generation, you could connect a K-Pro or an Apple II or an IBM PC to a telephone line and exchange information and hold your data and use an expensive software to take advantage of uh, new technology. And uh, it was very exciting and very inspirational. And I tell you that story because it was almost 20 years later that I was approached by the Internet Society when they said, we want to create a new domain uh, for the Internet. Actually, the .org had been established, but we wanted to create a management mechanism through the public interest registry uh, that would provide support uh, to the Internet Society, which I was a member of and had been to many conferences. And we really see an opportunity here to create an exemplary domain. Uh, we you know, fully respect the purpose of the .com and the .edu, and I think we had some country code uh, top-level domains at the time. We were not yet, yet into the domain name explosion. Uh, that came many years later. Um, so we helped establish the uh, public interest registry to uh, manage the .org. I was one of the uh, founding board members and later chair. I worked with uh, David Maher and Kathy was there and we later hired Ed Viltz uh, to be our first uh, CEO. I helped write this, by the way, uh, back in 2003. Um, I was very proud of our mission. Uh, we didn't plan to be a gatekeeper. Some people said, well, you know, if you're going to have uh, nonprofits, you really need to make sure they're 501c3s recognized by the IRS. I said, how in the world are we going to manage this? I mean, the rules for nonprofits vary around the world. It's not really our role. We hope that through the mission and the advertising, we will promote nonprofit activity. But we never said, oh, you can be in the .org and, and you can't. And I do think over time, 
uh, contrary to some of the uh, criticism that I have recently seen, I think the .org has largely maintained its purpose. Uh, organizations that register in the .org are sending a message. They are saying, for people who still do get to see domain names, you know, our, our primary purpose is probably non-commercial. We may be an association or, or a church group or an advocacy organization or a medical center. I mean, that's very powerful, by the way, because it also means that over time, these organizations have built their brand and their reputation as to the type of organization they want to be seen online. So that's one part of the history. Another part of the history to share with you is we took all of these obligations and in our initial uh, mission very seriously. We started looking at the issue, for example, of international domain names. You know, the internet uh, 20, 30 years ago was, was kind of US centric. I mean, ICANN was literally a US corporation. And to you know, Andrew's point about trying to build out support for the internet, we thought about how do we create domain names with non-Latin character sets? That actually took some work. And it was the public interest registry managing, managing the .org that first did IDNs. Now we did DNSSEC to deal with problems of fraud online, which was another concern. We took some very good positions early on, Andrew mentioned, regarding encryption and privacy for who is. And we really saw ourselves as trying to convey a public-spirited mission, not telling domain name registrants what they should or shouldn't do, but creating a space on the internet where non-commercial activity could thrive. Now, I wrote about this recently in a commentary uh, for The Hill because I was genuinely saddened, I use that word, I was saddened to read the news that the public interest registry would essentially be sold to Ethos Capital. And it's not a criticism of the people involved. I could actually understand from the business perspective on the, from the internet society's <laughs> point of view, they're trying to uh, manage programs. It would be very nice to have a big endowment. It would be very nice if that endowment generated, you know, an annual income stream that would support uh, your activity. I don't see anything obviously wrong with that. I don't even see anything necessarily obviously wrong with a private investment firm that says, you know, we want to support a particular part of the internet. I can imagine some scenarios where that might even be made to work. But I have real concerns about this. Um, Mitch has described a number of issues that EFF and other groups have highlighted about this sale. I will share with you uh, my concern, which maybe Professor Leff will, will see or, or anticipate. But you know, when we were established as a C3, that brought with it certain obligations about transparency and accountability. It meant that our financial statements were publicly available. It meant that the minutes of our meetings were publicly available. It meant that we had a public process for the selection of board members. And though we certainly knew we were responsible for providing support for the work of the Internet Society, we hardly viewed that as our only purpose. In fact, we looked at these activities, and we oftentimes asked ourselves, how do we advance those goals? We created, by the way, an advisory council. Uh, we created mechanisms for public input, and we took those comments into account as we were making decisions for the organization and the management of the .org, because that's what nonprofits with educational and charitable missions are expected to do. That's basically the deal. When you go to the IRS and you say, we're going to be free of taxes, but we're going to do something that's going to advance the public interest. That was our mission. And I simply don't understand how that full mission, not just the steady income stream that the Internet Society would like, and I understand that, I don't understand how that full mission 
can be accomplished under the terms of the Civil Rights Act. And that's why I would really urge you know, ICANN and ISARC to think about this, not with criticism directed to the participants of the deal, but rather to the larger purpose of the .org. We desperately need to promote and protect the non-commercial space on the internet. It is disappearing. It's literally like national land that's being gobbled up by private investment companies. And if we lose the .org from the non-commercial public interest domain, I honestly don't know what's going to be left. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Another round of applause please, for all of our speakers. I'm going to come around to the front. Uh, is this microphone on? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so we have some. Are there any urgent questions that a speaker would like to ask the speaker? We have a, a group of people who have come with questions, as well as the audience with questions, and I know some of them are leaving soon. So let me ask first urgent questions from one speaker to another. Okay. Then let me turn to this group of people that have tent cards and are some of our special guests from internet pioneers to ISAC board members to Americans for Financial Reform. Just to, so first, first crack at questions goes to you. Do you have any questions that you'd like to raise, questions, comments? Sure. Um, and we're thinking under five minutes. If that. Sure, I, I have a ton of questions. I'm Mike Godwin, uh, I, I'm on the ISOC board. I have a ton of questions, uh, so I'm not gonna ask them. I'm <laughs> gonna ask like one. Um, uh, and I'll say as a preface, you know, I, I, I appreciate that uh, Mark's comment that ISOC's made a good business decision for ISOC. And certainly that argument can be made. But for me, as a board member, I just came on last year, uh, if I had thought that we were getting a payday but were not taking care of PIR and .org, I would have voted <coughs> against the deal. And I believe that's true of other board members as well. Uh, we have another board member. Or we have had another board member. Um, so I, I just wanted to add that, but but with but I want to address Mitch's uh, question about or you're raising questions, Mitch, about how to make the money back on the investment, and I think you had some ideas about data mining and so on. And I want to ask, and I think it's really good to ask with Mark uh, here as well, uh, how could that possibly be done consistent with the general data privacy regulation? I mean. It seems to me that what you're positing is exploiting private ownership of the public interest registry to gather information that seems to be clearly inconsistent with, uh, G with, either with both the general data privacy re regulation and with analogous protections that are being built around the world. I am I right about that, or are there no privacy protections? What, what is the model under which that privacy private information is harvested. And, and that question is a big enough question, maybe Mark wants to answer it too, that I'll stop and let somebody else ask questions. I, I guess I'll address that. Um, we have high hopes for the success of GDPR and uh, uh, Congo went protections like the California uh, statute recently uh, come into force. Um, but uh, PIR as a for-profit subsidiary of Ethos Capital uh, will have 1.1 billion incentives to find ways around that. And that just seems like a clear potential area for them for them to explore and 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 please note that I, that I was not speaking about who is data so so there are contractual protections hotly debated at ICANN right now about the, uh, the personal information of registrants I'm talking about the personal the, the browsing information of visitors to those websites and I, I would hope that GDPR creates a barrier to that but but I'm I'm far from certain yeah, thank you. So, um, I, as I said before, I'm not a lawyer. I, I'm a mere geek. 
And um, I, I can tell you, in fact, that uh, it kind of doesn't matter whether the GDPR applies here because the, the data mining that we're talking about is not technically possible by the registry. The people who run the, the name servers I don't know how interested people are in this, but but basically there's a, a, a piece of this technology that's called delegation. And what happens is the parent side of the of the domain hands off to the um, to the child side of the domain. And it's the child side of the domain that is run by the people who put the registration in. The parent side of that transaction um, sends out its answers with a cache on it. It, it sends out a, a time to live on, on, on this um, on, on the information it sends. That time to live right now is, is about 24 hours. And what that means is that all of the interesting information about people's actual practices and so on are not available on the parent side. They're only available at a, another section of the, of the DNS called the resolver, which is the thing that you get when you connect to the internet, your provider or something like that tells you, here's the resolver. So the resolver can see all of this information and they can do, they can, they can profile you and so on, that's possible. But in fact, the name server side cannot do it. Um, and, and I'm not telling you this as a matter of theory, because in fact, I worked in the DNS business. And believe me, people wanted this data to be very, very valuable. They asked me to find it. I tried very hard to do this because that was my job, although I thought it was kind of gross. And the truth of the matter is, I couldn't find it. We couldn't make it valuable data. So the data stream is just not there. And that's part of the reason that I, I am not working because, because the Internet Society, let me um, finish with this, the Internet Society is genuinely concerned about that kind of behavior. And if we thought we were enabling it for a second, I don't believe we would, um, we would undertake any transaction. So I'd like to respond to that really quickly because I've consulted with a couple of experts on this. Um, that time to live that you mentioned is, is not an iron law. Um, it can be set to zero. The DNS is a distributed system where a lot of this information is cached at lower levels. It's often handled by internet service providers. Uh, Google and Cloudflare also, Fla Cloudflare also run resolvers. The registered operator can, if it chooses, at that time to live to zero, in which case they will see nearly every domain name lookup. Now, obviously, they need to be able to handle the traffic, but they could do that selectively. They could set the time to live to zero for every resolution of EFF.org, and they'd see every visitor to our website. <coughs> and they do that in a short enough time period, it wouldn't be all that visible or countable. So if that is a concern, as any lawyer would say, it ought to be in writing. I, I don't want to, I don't want to pursue this rap hole because I think that most of us are not really that interested in the technical details of the DNS, but let me finish by saying zero GPOs just don't work on the internet and they never have. Um. So I'm not going to go toe to toe with Andrew on the operation of the DNS, uh, but I will say, having read uh, Shoshana Zuboff's 800-page book, *The Age of Surveillance Capitalism*, one uh, clear message of that book is that if there is a way to extract commercial data, commercial value from personal data, it will be found. And we see this increasingly in the ad server model is encroaching into just about every realm and activity of, of uh, private life. Um, I don't have any uh, uh, strong expectation that the GDPR is going to be an effective bulwark against uh, that dynamic. And I think it is very important as we consider the sale of the dog ORG to understand the change in incentive the structure of the registry from one which is non-commercial with a public interest <coughs> to one which is commercial to generate profit. And this is a business that will be sitting on top of the data flows of the non-commercial entities connected to the internet all around the world. That makes me nervous. I'm going to hand the microphone now to someone who I know has to leave, Patrick Woodall, who I just met for the first time this morning. Could you introduce yourself? And uh, I know you have some comments as well. Thanks so much. Uh, I'm Patrick Woodall with Americans for Financial Reform. We tackle kind of the excesses in Wall Street, including on private equity. I think there's some unique issues with private equity purchases that are super important in this, in this world. Private equity takeovers like the one that's proposed 
are often very extractive. They, they end up raising fees, causing layoffs, severe cost cutting, and reductions in quality and service. And so you can say that these are investments with special attention that are going to reinvigorate PIR, but in reality, that's what they said to Toys R Us, that's what they said to Deadspin, and in the end, the investments were quite extractive. And the reason that they're so extractive is because the deals are financed with tremendous amounts of cash, or with debt. And this debt is the leverage in leveraged buyouts. And the debt is not imposed on the private equity firm. Ethos won't pay this debt. PIR will pay this debt. So if the debt is $360 million, uh, as Mitch says, or in many deals, it's upwards of 60 or more percent, which would be a $700 million loan. That is, to repay that debt would be $80 million a year. It's way in excess of PIR's current net income and surplus. And what this means is it puts tremendous pressure on PIR to do something to get that money to service that debt. And that can mean raising fees. That can mean really, really jacking up the prices for new people that are getting ORG accounts. And so those are the kind of things that are really concerning. I, I will say that generally, private equity has a disastrous record doing investing in things that have a public service mission. This year, Hahnemann Hospital in Philadelphia shut down after a private equity firm looted its real estate and just shut down the, op the operating room in the hospital. And that meant that there was a, a uh, really important safety net hospital in Philadelphia that just disappeared. I think the most parallel example is probably the newspaper industry. Private equity has bought 800 newspapers. They've slashed jobs. They've cut coverage of local government. And that's sort of the same thing. This is the, the kind of the ability, the important public interest mission of covering government to provide tools for democracy and to fulfill the mission of the newspapers has largely been destroyed by private equity investors. So I think from my perspective on the private equity side, the questions need to be twofold. One is the terms of the deal need to be really transparent. You need to know how much debt is involved, whether there are going to be additional uh, uh, kind of but fees taken out, these are super common in private equity transactions. And then the second thing to think about is most private equity uh, transactions are for a pretty short time. They're for five years or so. So any deal that you cut with ethos in terms of this, what will happen when ethos sells it? If you have some sort of, if you're comfortable with the mission on uh, what ethos is going to give you on this, and I think that's up for considerable dispute, but what happens when they sell it? So those two things really are important when you think about what's going to happen with this transaction. What does private equity itself, its structural behavioral model, do to this purchase of PIR and all the people that depend upon it? Can you just shut your microphone? I'd like to respond. Well, I can respond to some of it. Uh, so as a, as a practical matter, uh, this transaction has been subject to quite a bit more um, uh, scrutiny than most of the other. ICANN has two processes. One is a change of direct control where the, the registry operator is changing. So if PIR were changing to, you know, back to VeriSign, for instance, that's a direct change of control. And this other is the, is the change of indirect control. That is, who, who owns the thing um, is, is changing. And that's the, that's the situation we're in. So normally, this is a fairly lightweight process in ICANN. And this, has, this particular case has gone through a lot of so the numbers that were um, that, that were up there are, are public. Um, the 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 whole debt um, load is the one that you saw. Uh, this is um, not by normal um, the, the normal way that people talk about it. It's not a leveraged buyout. It it, it appears to be, uh, and and the information that we have is that the investors are really intending a long term play, and the. The impression that we have, but I can't speak for ethos, is that they're investors because they want a long-term return. You know, their family um, foundations and so on. So it uh, one of the problems, of course, it, and and we have suggested this to some of our colleagues that perhaps the term private equity was not the most um, salubrious uh, choice uh, for the description um, because uh, of of the admitted problems. I mean, there are problems um, in, in the investment. Now, again, I don't want to speak for, um, for ethos. 
Uh, so, you know, you really need to, uh, uh, to take up with them exactly what their investment plans are. But, but the, the information that you've seen is, in fact, the public information, and it's the information that we have as well. On the topic of what will happen the next time around, of course, in the event that they wanted to change this, um, they would go through the same uh, process that we're going through. And, uh, you know, there have been a lot of people who have been um, wondering about, you know, whether this is okay. And people have suggested, oh, it's been secretive and so on. But no, we like to follow the rules. That's what the Internet Society likes to do. We like to play by the rules and so on. And there are these rules. There are ICANN processes because the ICANN community has these kinds of processes for change of control. And that's what, and they were developed by the community. They were developed by a multi stakeholder a community that made these kinds of decisions. We are depending on that to be part of the story here. We are depending on the idea that there's a whole community of people who are interested in these kinds of things and are paying attention to it. And let me tell you, being on the receiving end of it, I assure you that they're paying attention. Um, uh, and, um, and, and, and that is something that is, is valuable. I don't think that that's a terrible thing. I think it's a good thing. I think that inspection of this sort of stuff is exactly what we want. And that's why we're having conversations like this. Could I jump in quickly? Um, yes, but I wanted to add something, if I might, which is, as, as a founding member of the non-commercial users constituency, I can maybe listening, but it hasn't created a process for reviewing this, and that's something that's been asked for and hasn't been given. So there's no public process now on this review of the change of control. So I just wanted to add that, and then, of course, yeah, yeah, you, you, you suggested that, that ICANN is engaged in substantial vetting. But, uh, Ethos has argued, PIR and Ethos have argued that ICANN's power in this circumstance is extremely narrow and that it really just amounts to verifying that the, the technical operations will, will continue as before. And they've said strongly and publicly that that is all ICANN is allowed to do. Now we disagree and ICANN has, has not said they've not engaged in a public process, but if that is the case, then I'm, I'm curious how, how you can say that this deal has received substantial vetting. And, and, and I, I'm also wondering, I mean, do you, is it your position that Ethos is not private equity? No, I, I um, so let me, uh, let me take these in parts. This is more than one thing here. Uh, I, I think that I can develop a process for change of indirect control. <laughs> It, that the process for that happened over years and years and years because there was, there was in fact, a lot of consideration during the expansion of the top level domain that probably there would be eventual consolidation in that area. And so there's a process for this, and that process limited ICANN's um, uh, areas of investigation uh, because the direct control of the contractual obligations are supposed to be the place that give you the um, uh, Give you the protections you want. Now, what people are saying is that the existing uh, agreement between PIR and ICANN is inadequate for those processes, and that the um, promises that Ethos is making are it is inadequate. And I guess the question that I have then is whether it's possible for there to be a mechanism that would be acceptable. Um, you know, if if uh, if Ethos were to agree to put these. Uh, uh, the, the price controls and the um, stewardship council and so on into a pick, for instance. I mean, would that be uh, would that, that be the mechanism that people want? I don't know. I haven't heard proposals about this. I've just heard a lot of uh, you know complaints that they're not there. But I would like to know what the positive story is on this because if we have such a positive story, then you have the contractual obligations that put people um, under control, uh, and that seems to be the story that people are, are asking. Interesting. Contractual obligations. That and Professor West Diagram showed us where those contractual obligations might come in and what their opportunity is. So this this sounds interesting. Well it would really be the, the contractual obligation in the in, in the registry agreement, right? Because that's the place where people have the ability to enforce. Okay. So Professor Farley, Christine Farley of Washington College of Law first and then Steve Steve Tucker. So maybe Steve, yeah. since you're a guest, I'm gonna Uh, first of all, uh, my thanks as well to, uh, to everyone. This is uh, interesting, well organized, and um, as Mark uh, commented, civilized, which is refreshing. Um, 
a uh, little bit of disclosure. I served on the ISOC board from 2003 to 2006. Um, and served on the uh, ICANN board um, for a long period of time, from 2002 roughly to a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, so I watched uh, the early part of this transaction, although I was not on the ISOC board when the decision was made. But while I was on the ISOC board, I, one of the areas that I was uh, tasked with was the interface between the Internet Society board and the PIR board. And so I interacted with Mark uh, and the original crew uh, during that period of time. Um, the, um, th there's some subtlety here that uh, uh, is not, I think, wired down tightly and so room for different interpretations, which is uh, partly what, what Kathy and several of you have talked about. Uh, my understanding, and I put this out there in a very personal way because I'm willing to be uh, called wrong on this, was that the creation of PIR as a separate entity was a organizational convenience, a management convenience. Let me, let me be very, very clear about what I'm talking about. The, um, there were 11, 11 groups that bid on the .org uh, acquisition away from VeriSign. And PIR, I'm sorry, uh, Internet Society, in combination with Affiliates, were the combination that bid on this and ultimately succeeded. The creation of PIR as a separate entity that, uh, and, and I recognize that the term uh, subordinate or wholly owned subsidiary is not precisely accurate from a legal point of view, but is sort of operationally equivalent, um, was a way of offloading the management task, the attention span and, and energy away from the core activities of uh, internet society. Um, and in order not to, to um, unbalance the attention uh, and, uh, and uh, organizational structure of the Internet Society management. So an alternative would have been, it seems to me, not to create PIR as a separate entity at all and simply absorb the operation of .org as one of the tasks within the corporate structure, within the organizational structure of the Internet Society, and then that would have had the usual challenges of getting people hired into the Internet Society, giving them the proper responsibility and oversight, uh, and uh, trying to do a span of things that uh, might have been a bit challenging. Uh, but it would have been an alternate approach to accomplishing the same uh, practical task and as I understand. If that were the case, and I don't have any reason to believe that it could not have been the case and was not effectively what was uh, uh, in mind, except that it was decided and I had no part in, in, in the decision process to create a separate entity uh, to offload, as I say, the uh, management task. Then this very uh, interesting uh, uh, structure of transitioning from uh, PIR to a, to a profit and then selling that off would have been a related diagram, but with fewer moving parts in which um, this simply would not have been a, uh, a new organization that had to be converted from, from nonprofit to for profit. It would have been the Internet Society selling off an asset that it owned stop, without any of this uh, intervention by Pennsylvania Orphans Court and other other mechanisms still would have involved indirect change of control in the ICANN interactions. I think it would have been a direct change of control. Apologies. Good. Okay. So it would have been a direct change of control. It would have gone through a different path in ICANN. Um, didn't mean to address that particular detail, but I appreciate the the clarification. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. No. No. That's that, that, that's good. That's I, I want to try to get it right. So, uh, if with that reading of history. Um, the emphasis on .org having other purposes other than providing financial uh, revenue stream for ISOC uh, somehow emerged in this process. And now the question is, was that 
a requirement? Was that necessary? Was that just uh, intuited? Or uh, where does that fit in the spectrum of uh, things that are forced? And um, I would imagine that besides Mark, there might even be other uh, responses that are possible. But uh, I thought I would open that up. Well, I mean, see, the answer to your question, are the articles of incorporation into the public interest registry? That's what we understood our purpose to be. Now, I take your point. There are other mechanisms that the Internet Society might have pursued at the time to generate the revenue from uh, the .org domain. I think there were some concerns about whether, in fact, and it wasn't so much management, for tax related reasons, whether the Internet Society could manage that kind of thing itself. So, this is where we ended up in 2003. I will say, you know, a lot of people, you know, devoted hundreds of volunteer hours over several years believing that we were pursuing a public service charitable function. And if I wanted to work for Affilius, I could have gone to work for Affilius and got paid for the management of a registry. But that wasn't the purpose of the public interest registry. And I also think that our active promotion of the .org produced benefits for the Internet Society that you might not all have even considered. Because we weren't just interested in the revenue stream. We were interested in trying to promote the purpose. I actually remember a conversation with Ed Vilts in 2004. We were upset that the Olympic Committee had the domain Olympics.com. He said, this is amateur sports. That should be Olympics.org. I mean, we were constantly thinking, how are we going to actively promote the use of the domain to advance our, our purpose? Um, and I don't mean to uh, diminish what you know, I think Professor Lev well described our subordinate role to the Internet Society was well understood, and in some respects that was almost a measure of success, was the domain growing. It grew, by the way, between 2003 and 2006, I think from 2.6 million registrants to over 5 million registrants. So we did a very good job in the early years of, of building support. But I think Professor Leff has also fairly explained that as a matter of tax law, you can't just create an entity, a nonprofit, you know, holding company to generate revenue for another nonprofit. And I think that the Internet Society believed that at the time and was not well advised. I don't know how much to get into the weeds on this, but you could have created a for-profit holding yeah. company and yeah. it would have been very similar from a tax perspective. Again, like I'm sure that there were very good lawyers working on this and I don't mean after thinking about it for a couple of days to <laughs> question their judgment, but um, there's lots of choices about what could have happened then and they each have legal implications and the reason why I didn't restrain myself from shouting out like, no, it would have been a direct change of controls because that's not something that I know about how robust I can't process what the difference between the process of a direct and an indirect is. When I started looking at these, I thought, why is this entity a Pennsylvania entity? And the first thought that came to me as a nonprofit lawyer, knowing nothing about the history of it, was, well, Pennsylvania has a, a um, conversion in place statute. So if someone came to me and said, I want to create an entity, and by the way, 10 years from now, I might want to make it a for profit and not have to go through a direct change of control, I would have said, hey, you should create that in Pennsylvania. California also has a statute. Anyway, I'm not saying that's what happened. I literally have no idea. I just mean that like, the, each of the moving pieces has a legal meaning, and it would have been different if it had been done differently. And I think you're right. There's no, I don't know of any impediment from a legal perspective from doing it without a separate entity or with a separate entity that wasn't a separate 51c3 nonprofit charity. But so, I just want to respond on, on two points that I can't give definitive answers to, but I can offer a comment. First of all, I, I'm under the impression that the reason it was Pennsylvania had nothing to do with, with looking that far ahead, had a lot to do with the fact that Affilius was a Pennsylvania operation. And so it was like going down the street. But I could be wrong about that, but I wasn't a principal involved in that. Second of all, you're probably right about that. Second of all, um, 
uh, although I was on the board during that early period on the ISAC board, um, I remember hearing some things about the tax status of PIR. And I'm under the impression, and again, I want to be very clear that I do not view myself as having authoritative knowledge on it, but I'm under the impression that there was a, a multiple steps involved, that this didn't all happen uh, at once with a clear plan, and that there was a fair amount of thinking and rethinking about tax status and uh, so forth. So um, it, 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 it occurred to me at the time, but it didn't occur to me to make an issue of it, that it could have been left as a regular for-profit company. Uh, it wasn't ever clear to me why it had to be converted to a nonprofit, and assuming that all of its uh, profit could have been dispersed to ISOC and relieved, therefore, of uh, tax issues. But as I say, I'm not a lawyer, uh, not even inclined to get anywhere close. <laughs> I just want to note that we've got about 15 minutes left and people in the public have been, you know, we've got a lot of people who've been waiting. So this is, this is critical. It looks like Andrew wants to respond. Received or did, it, it's a great discussion. Christine, uh, Professor Farley, you wanted to ask a question. Sure. Um, Christine Farley, um, a faculty director of one of the sponsoring organizations, Program on Information, Justice, and Intellectual Property, which can be found at pigip.org. Um, the other sponsoring organization is the Internet Governance Lab .org. Um, so no conflict of interest or anything. But um, I wanted to uh, come back to something you said, Mitch, about um, the uh, consequences. Some of the consequences of the sale um, would be that in the contract, um, new uh, newly created rights protection mechanisms would attach to the .org domain. And um, I, I just want to, I, I wanted to invite you to say a bit about that. So um, uh, for instance, I gather one of the consequences would be that um, a trademark owner who has registered their trademark in the trademark clearinghouse would therefore have the first opportunity to register their trademark in .org before any, any non-trademark owner and I wonder if you have had any opportunity to get information about how many not-for-profits or non-commercial um, uh, uh, people, entities, um, have a registered trademark in the, in, the, in the trademark clearinghouse. Because otherwise, it would seem that uh, registrants in .org would be subject to more restrictions than registrants in .com. Thank you. So the things that I described, um, one of them is for certain, and then it's one called URS, Uniform Rapid Suspension, which was designed for the, the expansion of the top-level domain names. It was not designed to be applied to the legacy top-level domain names. Um, but with this contract renewal that happened last summer, uh, um, coinciding with the formation of Ethos Capital, uh, the URS was applied to .org. Uh, now that's a um, accelerated, uh, streamlined mechanism for suspending domain names on an accusation of uh, um, cyber squatting. Um, the the remaining ones are things that, that ICANN has now given .org permission to do, but they have they have not announced that they're going to do them yet. Uh, now several people associated with with uh, PIR, particularly its uh, CEO, Jonathan Abbott, um, presided over some similar mechanisms at Donuts Incorporated, another, another registry. Um, and, and it was, in fact, uh, people, like businesses with trademarks in the trademark clearinghouse having the, the first right of refusal over domain names containing that trademark. Um, it would be nice to know how many nonprofit organizations are in the trademark clearinghouse, but unfortunately, the contents of the trademark clearinghouse are a secret. Any other responses? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the response. Open to the public. The floor is open. Who would like to ask a question? I have not seen Rod Beckstrom, former chair of ICANN, for many years. 
Thank you, Kathy. Great to see you and many others here. Um, and just to correct that record, I'm former uh, CEO and president of IKEA and board member. Thank you. Close enough. Uh, and I'm <laughs> an disclosure uh, advisor to Mark's organization, Epic, and a supporter of EFF. So a lot, a lot of ties here. And what, I, what I'd like to do is actually to make a legal argument, make an argument that I don't necessarily agree with, but I'm going to make some several arguments here and love to hear the group's response to, for the sake of elucidating what I believe the core issues are here. The starting point for me, by the way, as a former CEO of ICANN and someone who's been very uh, involved in the internet community and nonprofits for a, a long time, is I, I felt incredibly sad when, when I read the news. I, I, I was just shocked. Um, not just because this nonprofit asset was being monetized, but because of how it was handled and the lack of openness and transparency and public process that I'm used to seeing in the ICANN process. So just so I feel very sad, was very surprised. I'm not necessarily opposed to the transaction, but I'm gonna make some arguments here. First are moral arguments that relate to what what is the role of a nonprofit in being a for benefit uh, corporation. And that then relates to legal issues related to nonprofits. And finally I'm gonna make uh, some economic arguments because I am an expert in the domain name industry, and I was an analyst at Morgan Stanley before I got involved in this line of work. So um, on the moral side, uh, the job of a 501c3, uh, as the professor said, is to, to, be a, 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 to work for the public benefit. Mark elucidated that as well. And if we look at this situation then, both PIR and ISOC have, I'm going to argue, two major constituencies uh, that they benefit. One is the registrants, all the .org registrants that uh, have domains. Secondly, ISOC and the organizations it benefits and the global internet, such as IETF, IAB, Internet Society chapter. So there's kind of those two buckets. And I'm going to make the argument that clearly what's been done here is one's been traded off for the other, right? I mean, if, if the registrants had rights as a nonprofit to have a benefit, then they're losing that benefit when the ownership goes to a profit maximizing private equity firm, clearly. And so I think that the burden of responsibility to ISOC as an organization and its leadership, board leadership, and PIR is to show the analysis they've done of why there's more public benefit by giving away the public benefit of the registrants and letting all of it accrue through money to IETF, IAB, and the other activities. So I'm going to argue that I haven't seen that analysis done. And I haven't heard it articulated. All I've heard is a very weak argument that, well, this was done, so more products and services could be offered. Well without defining what they are. And obviously the private equity firm is going to seek to do as many profit maximizing moves as it can, but if they're going to benefit the public, that should be stated. And if the and, and similarly, if the public is, the, and by the public, I mean the, the nonprofit organizations who are beneficiaries, I'm going to argue under Article 18 here of the uh, of, of uh, PIR, um, then those should be stated what the protections specifically are in the contract of sale. And they're not. So I'm going to argue that clearly it seems that the public benefit of the registrants has been traded off for the, the, the other beneficiaries. So that's just one argument. Um, and I would just like to see the analysis of it because I haven't seen it. Now I'm going to make a, a legal argument now. If that analysis was not truly done, then are the organizations ISOC and PR, are they acting as profit for benefit, proper for benefit organizations? Or are they failing in their fiduciary responsibility? And I don't know because I haven't seen the data. I haven't even seen the argument of this analysis. So that's, that's the first point. Now I want to, and, and that relates to legality because it's the IRS's job to determine whether they're living up to their charter or whether even this form of monetization oh. should change the status of other, other entities involved. And now I'm going to make an economic argument real quickly. I believe this deal is significantly underpriced, massively underpriced. If you believe that it's fine to trade off the registrants in the public sector, and, and, and .org, and you want to take that benefit and move it over to the other beneficiaries, well, then you should at least make it a market transaction. But clearly, this, does not, this is not a market transaction. It doesn't appear to be one. I've heard some analysis or report was done. I haven't seen it. Has it been published? Um, but here's the argument. It's very simple. How do you value a domain name and relate it to the market capitalization of a company? Well, VeriSign's the global market leader, and they're worth about $200 per name. They're worth over $40 billion, and... Um, uh, or I forget the exact number, it's over $200 a name. This transaction is being done at $100 per name. Why? And why particularly? Because this has no price caps. VeriSign has price caps. They just renegotiated their contract with ICANN. VeriSign should be worth less per domain name than the .org asset. And so it doesn't appear that it's a market transaction, yet that's the fiduciary responsibility of the board. And the way you get a market transaction, by the way, is you have an auction. 
or you hire an investment banker. You don't do a backdoor deal. You don't do a deal that's not seen and that gets exposed to the public that allegedly was put together in two months of time. So, so, uh, I, so I'm going to argue here it's absolutely not an economic transaction. It's priced 50% uh, or 20 30% below the market, costing and losing IETF, IAB, between $500 million and $1 billion. And I'd like to see the analysis that shows it was a market transaction, and we can determine very quickly if it is, put it up for auction. You are anyway, you're selling anyway, put it up for auction and let the highest, the highest bidder pay. So again, I'm not saying I agree with the arguments I've made. I've made them intentionally. This is a law school with a lot of brilliant people in it. But these are the issues that I believe should be considered uh, in this discussion and debate. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. What we're going to do now, since we've just got a, a few moments and less the speaker's object, is sweep through and then give everyone a, a minute or two to, to wrap up. Because clearly we're not ending this discussion here. Um, so I saw some hands up. Um, do you mind if we try the side of the room? Good afternoon, and thank is it on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you all for your presentations. Uh, my name is Erica Basu. I'm an early career internet governance scholar and hopefully practitioner uh, from the Global South. And because I think representation matters, I'm going to make the Global South uh, question here. Um, I'm just uh, a little worried as well as uh, concerned that the organization that holds internet and digital access and rights to the developing countries as one of its foremost missions would sell the domain name and public registry um, to a for-profit organization at a time when global civil society organizations that depend on the .org domain name uh, is being stifled, surveilled, and uh, heavily uh, under threat of their very existence. So I find a kind of dichotomy and uh, dissonance over there. And I'm just trying to understand how and what, um, what imperatives other than just sheer profit drove this kind of decision. We could be here for another two hours. Really, really good question. Professor Shalek. Uh, I'm Ann Shalek. I teach here too. Um, I have the most casual passing knowledge of these substantive issues um, from having worked with uh, our PIDGET program and our intellectual property clinic here uh, over the years. So I ask these as somebody who comes at these questions from the perspective of the public interest world. And there's a theme I hear in many of the questions and in many of the presentations that has a legal component um, in terms of private markets and in terms of public interest entities, the formation of, of nonprofits, um, uh, and in terms of markets. Um, but so one theme is transparency, that people keep coming back to, we don't know. These terms are not clear. These commitments have not been clearly stated or known. So both in terms of legal regulation, both in terms of nonprofit and um, commercial transactions, how do you all think about a seeming enormous lack of transparency about this transaction at multiple levels? why that matters. My other concern has to do with the community and the people whose interests are at stake here. Um, the most public interesty framing of this seems to be the dot org community, the dot org organizations who are 
committed to, have invested their time and effort and trust in .org. But I bring to this, too, the people in society who depend upon the public interest community, who depend upon .org organizations, who rely upon them, who actually look at the domain name when we do a search in terms of going to a site or not um, as a surrogate for lots of other things. But it, it has meaning. And it seems like in this discussion, the meaning to societal users of this transaction has gotten lost in the discussion, the, often in the way that discussions of the internet often seems like it's a parallel universe. We're going to talk about the public interest within the, within the internet world, and then we're going to talk about the public interest within the, 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 the material, actual world, as if those are two separate things. And that's how this discussion strikes me, because the users of the internet and the, and the people who depend upon the .org um, organization of the internet world um, are not part of what is being discussed today. And that's maybe because you all know more about what matters here in terms of making or stopping this transaction. But that background seems really critical to what's at stake here. We keep seeing this in every single issue about what happens with the internet, that the real users, uh, that, that what happens to real people and real organizations at the end comes up at the back end, not at the front end. So. Um, one, let's look at the hands that are up. One, two, three, four. Um, can we stay a little longer? And the speakers stay a little longer. Uh, and again, what we're still doing is sweeping the room. Thank you, Professor Shalek. Sweeping the room. Shorter comments now. We're going into shorter comments as we hit two o'clock our time. And again, the mic will we'll go back to the speaker to, to, uh, for final comments. Hi, my name is Burja Kuch, and I direct the digital rights program at Public Citizen. And Public Citizen is one of those organizations that, which is very concerned about like this uh, this this controversial sale of that org. And thanks, Mitch, and thanks, Mark, for, uh, for giving voice to our concerns. And I'm going to be very uh, brief. This is a corporate takeover. And what are we going to do? I mean, my question is, what's next? And how can we fight all this? Thank you. We'll pass it back to uh, Richard. Your hand was up. Or? I guess I'm happy to go last. Hi, I'm Jim Tupin. I'm an adjunct here teaching intellectual property. Um, I actually have a question, not a comment. Um, Mr. Sullivan referred to uh, value, I'm not sure I'm going to get the verb right, that could be achieved uh, by a, a for-profit organization that couldn't be achieved through the existing uh, pr uh, structure. My question is, apart from generating a, a, an endowment for the parent, what was that value? What were the things that could be accomplished by the that the that that your board saw that could be accomplished through the sale that couldn't be accomplished by the current setup? Um, okay. So uh, my name is John Moore. I'm actually been with the DC chapter of the Internet Society, but I'm also a community organizer. I'm involved with five or six dot orgs, uh, and some of them are ones that are in the environmental area. They're very combative. We're not, you know, but I have to say that I'm not certain that I spend my time worrying over who is running dot org as long as some of the many different uh, restraints are put onto it. And the second thing I would say, also having been involved with nonprofits with endowments, that when I first ran into ISOC, I wondered why they had their endowment in a single, a single uh, source of income. 
it is a basic rule of fiduciaries on boards of nonprofits to diversify their endowments. Hi, I'm Richard Barnes. I serve on the board of the Green Society. I want to thank Mark for framing about um, ensuring that there's space for non commercial activities. I think you really put it there. I, I suspect there is not much disagreement in this room that that is a really important goal of many, many of our society shares. Um, what I want to contrast that with, though, is this idea that you know, getting a domain name is not the only thing you need to be on the internet and have an internet presence and be visible. And if you look at a lot of the other services that are involved in, in being a nonprofit and having engaging in non-commercial activities on the internet, almost all of them are provided by for-profit entities. And I believe in many markets, serve these non-for-profits, serve these non-commercial activities quite well. I can just like jot down my notes here. I can open the internet service. Registrars, DNS hosting, login credentials, web development, analytics, ads. All of these are for profit markets, for better or worse, but um, you know, somehow nonprofits are able to thrive in these circumstances. So I, I'm curious um, what your thoughts are on kind of what the space is we need to protect for nonprofits and whether you know, having a domain registry in particular, how that becomes, whether that's a critical part of that space. All amazing questions. So a round of applause for people who ask the question. Thank you. I'm turning it back to the speakers, but I'm going to do my conclusion first so that you be the, you'll be the wrap up. I hope we have achieved our goal of having a fireside chat, a conversation with each other, not at or past each other, and exploring some of the new issues, uh, the complicated transactions in new ways. I certainly learned a lot in this conversation. So. Let me just, is it okay? We'll just go down the line, whatever you'd like to do in, in a moment or two of wrap up because there are amazing questions on the floor, but the conversation will continue. We're just in one stop and we thank the speaker for being part of the ongoing discussion and particularly having it here. So over to you. Uh, thanks everyone, especially Kathy, uh, 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 Christine, uh, the, the, the programs here at AU and my fellow panelists. Um, I. We'd love to respond to questions individually, but, but, but uh, I, for the sake of time, I will simply wrap up and say the, the, the operation of .org by a private for-profit company is not itself a problem, nor really any single factor that I mentioned, but, but together they, they are a problem. The operation of .org by a private equity-owned for-profit company with a legal and economic mandate to earn significant returns on its $1.1 billion investment, run by people with a track record of engaging in censorship for profit and, and other sources of revenue that do not serve the registrants. Putting those together, those, those are a problem, uh, and I, uh, I'm trying to simply echo the concerns of the, the nonprofits um, now over 700 uh, that have, have signed the uh, uh, petition that we're a part of. Uh, and I uh, encourage anyone who is concerned about this to sign that petition, either uh, nonprofit organizations or other non-commercial users and, uh, and individuals. And that's at save.org.org. That's S-A-V-E D-O-T-O-R-G dot O-R-G. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'll just thank you for including me in this conversation, and I'll just cede my time to the other panelists. I'm sure have much more important things to say than anything I would say. Uh, well, that's very kind of you, but I don't think that's true. I think you drew a beautiful diagram, and I think it helped a lot of people <laughs> to understand what's going on here. Um, uh, so, thank you to all the other panelists and to everybody who came today. I, I think that this is uh, useful. Obviously, I'm very keen for people to understand uh, what it is that um, that we're trying to do and the vision that we have for the future. .org is an important part of the infrastructure of the internet and, and for non-commercial users in particular. And that includes um, people who are dependent upon, um, upon that domain name. But in a changing industry, in an industry, and it is an industry, I know that people sometimes don't like that, but that was a decision made in the 1990s. Um, you know, the, the businesses who are involved in that area need to be able to respond to the market. So to answer inadequately this question about um, what are we, uh, you know, what are these other uh, 
other sorts of considerations. Fundamentally, I, you know, I came from the tech industry, and, and fundamentally, when you have investors, there are really two things you need from them. Yeah, you need money, but really what you need is advice. You need somebody who understands what, what sorts of challenges you're facing. And the internet society is not built to do that kind of function. I mean, we have lots and lots of things that we do well, but you know, helping tech companies is not really on the list. And, uh, and, and we need, therefore, to make sure that this is a piece of infrastructure and, and a service that is there for the non-commercial community you know, for the next 50 years. And that's a really, really important function. It's one of the obligations that we have to make sure that it is, is vital. And I am worried that the Internet Society is not the best steward for that. It doesn't mean that you know, if it stays at the Internet Society, that would be a catastrophe. I don't think it would be. But I think that if the non-commercial users of the Internet want the best home for themselves, they deserve the, the, the kind of investment that comes from people who are focused on making sure that that system works best for them. Well, I just want to begin by saying that um, Public Interest Registry has a remarkable history of success. I mean, for almost 20 years, going back before Google and Facebook, you have managed to provide a very little cost, a very uh, nice presence on the internet to just about any organization that wanted an internet presence. And I always thought that was a wonderful mission. I think it's been well executed. I know that growth has slowed in recent years, which is one of the issues that you're now dealing with. But I haven't seen the alarm bells go off and say, this is too difficult for us to manage. In fact, as some of the speakers explained earlier today, a registry is actually quite limited in terms of what it could do with regard to the management of the domain name. So, you know, my heart is like with Berju on the morality of the moment, but my head is actually with Rod, because there's another part of this that just leaves me feeling that this is almost the worst of all possible outcomes. In other words, an obvious outcome is to continue down the present road. But maybe there's a decision made that says, no, we really need to change because there's a problem. So I want to know what the problem is. And if there's a problem, how does the transfer solve it? And if there's economic value that the Internet Society feels that it needs, I'd like to see the case that this was the best outcome to maximize the return of the economic value of the domain name. Let's actually have that conversation. Because here's something else to think about with regard to domain names. And I know a bit about this. The demand for .org is, as economists would say, price inelastic. You could raise that price from $10 a year to $50 a year to $100 a year. And I suspect that the demand would fall off very little. And the reason, obviously, is that so many organizations <coughs> have tied their identity to .org. This is more true with .org than it is with .com. You could go from .com to .net. I don't think people would much care. But where are people going to turn from .org if they don't like what happens next? So if you really want to make the case for the sale of the .org, I think you have the responsibility, the fiduciary obligation, to justify the need for the sale, and then to demonstrate that you've obtained the best outcome. And I think if you do those things, I'm not sure how we object. I mean, we will always have our moral concerns. But at this moment, based on this conversation, I don't see the reason for the sale. If the sale were to occur, I don't understand why you're getting so little. Thank you. Yes. Hi. 